Okay, Tenakaute Tefano, it's my pleasure today to welcome Matt Ensor. Um, amongst the many hats that Matt wears at the engineering consultancy Becker, he's the founder of Frankly AI, a conversational agent designed to consult and engage with stakeholders and communities at a deeper and more meaningful level using artificial intelligence. Um, but before we talk about Frankly AI and your talk you've done elsewhere on Paris mm. on Quant, um, I want to ask you a few questions about your career. Sure. Um, since you started at Becker or Becker Carter Hollings and Ferner, as it was way mm. back then, mm. um, you've had a number of roles both with Becker and with other organizations. How would you describe your career? Yeah. That's a good question. My, my career was supposed to be quite simple. I, um, when I was at school, I was fascinated by transport. And uh, so I decided to make the, you know, the biggest impact I'll get into road safety and traffic safety. Uh, and so I asked um, people who did that kind of stuff, oh, what degree did I, did I need? And they said, oh, I need to be an engineer, civil engineer. So I thought, great, sorted. Um, so I did my civil engineering degree and I got into road safety. And um, I suppose I have the, the curse of, 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 of needing an interesting career. And, uh, I can remember going, to, it's actually at Auckland University, I went to a um, professional society meeting and, and looking around me and, and seeing ahead of, in front of me just basically a, a row of sort of balding heads. And I thought, this is going to be quite linear, this career. You know, I'm going to end up 40 years time being an expert in road safety, but, um, but not going, you know, not, not doing a whole range of things. So I, um, I applied to the Ministry of Defence. They had a job going. Uh, which was to evaluate all their large capital purchases, so if they buy aircraft yep. or warships or things like that. And I thought, oh, you know, I'll be able to convince them that my skills in road safety, as it turns out, and economics would be relevant to, to government. And so luckily I got the job. I, on my first day I arrived and the guy sitting next to me, he said, he said you, you know you were our second choice. <laughs> and so <laughs> I always think I was very lucky that the first choice turned him down. So. Yeah, I played around with, and went on exercise with the Navy and the Army and Air Force for four years and yep. got to know defence and military and technology um, and then decided that was enough really, so I went travelling. Um, and that was probably the turning point of my career. I came back to New Zealand after travelling uh, without a job and it was yep. summer, so I had a grand old time and I thought, oh, I really don't want to go back and work in an office. And so um, I decided, this was before MasterChef, I just read a book by Anthony Bourdain. Okay, yes. I thought, that sounds, that sounds fascinating. So um, I decided I was going to be a chef for a year. And so the, the training actually was the easier part of that. I spent four months um, uh, learning how to cook yep. and then working um, for uh, uh, in a fine dining restaurant in Wellington. Do you still cook? Yeah, yeah. It's one of those things. It taught me two things, actually, chefing. One, one was flavours. Yep. You never lose that. Flavours and chopping, you know, I'd always be able to do those things. But it also taught me, it was a role where we had 10 hour shifts yep. and there wasn't time to, uh, you know, have a cup of coffee or sit, sit down and have a yatta with someone and it was just really hard work. And I always remember, you know, when I'm thinking of, I'm busy now, I remember back those times yep. and, uh, and that was really busy. Uh, but then, yeah, they asked me to work Christmas Day or New Year's Day and I thought, well, that's probably the end of my career. <laughs> so I, um, I quit and... To cut a long story short, I ended up back at Becker. Yep. It was sort of a default decision because I wasn't quite sure. You know, I wanted a really interesting career. But I couldn't decide what to do, so I thought, oh, well. And I suppose that was a lesson. If you go back into a big company, uh, good people, uh, the head office, there's just so many different opportunities. And so I ended up actually in the management, um, management stream. I was one of the few people that were fascinated by people, yep. not by engineering. Well, what do you mean the management stream? So I ended up being um, uh, what we call section manager. Mm -hmm. So um, moved away from the technical side and just had to look after recruitment and 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 people. Um, and it's part of, I suppose, you know, when you can't, when you have different interests um, in a firm, that uniqueness I think is really valuable to to kind of get you get you into roles that you know in these cases often people didn't didn't want. So you no longer think of yourself as an engineer, or are you still an engineer at heart? Oh, I, sometimes I describe myself um, as a social scientist trapped in an engineering firm. Um, I went back to university and studied social science, sociology, yep. uh, and then management and leadership. And it was, I think, that different perspective which meant that 
as I'll explain in a minute, I've, I've ended up doing um, things in the firm uh, which are quite entrepreneurial really because, because our core business is not what I do. So I'm, I'm trying hard to imagine the entrepreneurial engineering consultancy firm. So what mm. sort of entrepreneurial things are you... So my, um, so my fascination is the intersection between technology, uh, community and infrastructure. So, you know, how do people use infrastructure? How do we design it, you know, for the best, um, best outcomes uh, and those sorts of things? And um, engineer is a, it's a, it's a very creative field. So they're forever solving, solving problems, mm -hmm. but they're typically solving problems with, um, you know, materials or physics or resources yep. and things like that. So what I've done is expand our remit into solving issues that involve uh, I suppose a sociological view of infrastructure. Was it hard to, for want of a better word, socialise that idea into Becker? Because you don't, th <laughs> you know, sociology and engineers is not, you, do, you don't normally think of them in the same sentence. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I suppose the benefit is, is that we're, you know, we're quite a client focused organisation. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so what you'll find is in our clients, there will be people who see the world the same way as I do. Yep. Um, and if you're in a profession filled with 90% you know, of people seeing things a certain way, that uniqueness is, 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 is really valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Plus I'd say, you know, you've got to, and I've, I've seen this in different sectors, you've, you, you've got to have credibility in that sector. Mm -hmm. Some of it's, you know, speaking the language, but having an engineering background and a social science background, I think, is important. So mm. yes, as a social scientist alone, I might have rattled around a bit, yep. not got much traction. Yeah, yep. but, but your record as an engineer and then a successful manager of engineers gave you the basis to be different in some ways. Yeah, and it's not easy, as I yep. say. Um, you know, the firm and the KPIs and the uh, even the job descriptions aren't designed around folk like me. So, yep. so you do have to be. Uh, a little bit courageous, I suppose, and just doing what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if that sociologist engineer was at the heart of your talk you gave a little while ago at Tech Week, mm. um, Poets versus yeah. Quants. Yeah. Um, what's behind that choice of Yeah, title? I'm not sure if you use that term here in, in Auckland. Um, I went to, uh, fortunate enough to go to INSEAD Business School yep. in France. And uh, so it's a term they use over there to basically describe you know, the, 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 the um, cohort of MBAs. They're either poets, so they use, you know, talking and yep. relating and storytelling to, to be successful. Uh, or you're a quant, which of course is, you know, using numbers and uh, economics and, yep. and those sorts of things. And I always found that was, um, well, I love the, yeah, I love the idea that you're a, you're a poet or a quant. But the, I suppose, in just in recent years, um, we did a bit of a look at Becker, um, looking at what, as it's going back about three years, you know, looking at what technologies were coming that were going to change the way we delivered services mm -hmm. uh, or the way our clients would, would work. And, um, and it sounds strange now in 2021, but in 2017, I suppose it was, to say actually, you know, we should start looking at artificial intelligence was, was quite radical. Mm -hmm. People were like, well, you know. process uh, communications or uh, documents or social media or and and actually for the AI to be able to communicate and 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 understand and so what I realized was that actually the poets now have tools that only the quants have had in the past so quants have kind of at least in my um, field have dominated decision making yeah it's been all about money or time or land or or and, it, and those things are very quantifiable um, but my background, I guess, is, a, is a, from social science. Y you really want to understand uh, sort of social equity. So you know, different people have different aspirations, different needs, uh, and we've seen lots of cases where you roll out infrastructure, or you roll out services that are yep. equal for everyone, um, but some people benefit and, and some people don't. And so the, the the thrust behind poets versus quants was was really to show people how now and this is only in the last few years, now with 
NLP AI, we can listen to every person in the community. We can actually find out, you know, what are their needs um, and, uh, and process that and deliver that in a way that people can adjust the way they might design infrastructure mm -hmm. or, or, or roll, out, uh, roll out infrastructure. So that's kind of the origin of, um, of Frankly. It's right. really creating a system so that we can uh, hear from everyone and uh, be able to process and understand what everyone's saying about you know, their needs or, or, or things like that. Um, our mantra or our vision is no voice left behind. Right. So what we're really trying to do is use AI to be able to make sure that we remove the barriers from everyone kind of having a say. But can't you just go out and do a survey? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's what the quants say. So we've got I'm, lots I'm a lot of heart. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that um, probably annoys me the most about um, collecting information is the questions where you'll, it'll be a statement and it'll be, you know, do you strongly agree, agree, neutral, yep. disagree? Yep. And of course, that's turning amazingly rich information into, you know, a bar chart. And, and my experience is people ignore the you know, ignore the edges and just look at the, at the middle and they'll yeah. say, right, 55% of people support this project. Whereas in reality, what you need to do is understand the fringes because they're the people that, that will miss out from the, yeah. typically miss out from the, from the benefits of that. So what we've done is created, instead of effectively a survey monkey um, or a Qualtrics kind of survey, we've created something that's entirely conversational. Uh, it's multilingual, um, so we're taking away that barrier of, you know, your first language might not be English. Uh, you can do it on, you know, various platforms. You don't have to, you know, have a laptop and a phone and app, um, yep. do it in many different ways. ways. We're basically trying to do everything we can to make it as easy as possible for anyone to be able to give their views. So, I'm going to be a little bit naive here. What why are you doing that in the first place? What's changing because you're doing that? So what, yeah. what are you doing with these views? Do they? So it's 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 effectively listening listening to the people who at the moment don't have voices. Yep. So it's it's as I say at, at the moment everything is simplified. Everything is turned into uh, is turned into numbers. Yep. Um, and so and but it's but particularly important for you know different cultural um, heritage and things like mm -hmm. that you know what might suit your typical um, uh, you know folk like you and me might not yeah. suit someone else yeah what I'm trying to get at is what's the context in which you use frankly is it for deciding where you might put a bus stop or yeah it's all those things um, what we've found is that most people, when they're doing consultation or surveys, they'll find out the things they're expecting to find out. Mm -hmm. uh, with AI, uh, we don't, we don't, we start off with completely open questions uh, because the AI is smart enough to, you know, move on from there. So we might say, "Hey, Peter, you know, what's what's your what's your what's your biggest uh, what's your biggest hope for the future of Auckland?" Uh, that's a pretty big question. Uh, <laughs> might make it a little bit smaller. But then what will happen is the AI will be able to engage you on the issues that are important to you. Um, and so what we find is that our average conversation length is about, is over a quarter of an hour. Really? So we're getting really rich information uh, and we have a 90% return rate, uh, or 90% um, intention to return. Right. So only 10% of people are saying, oh no, I probably wouldn't use this again. Yep. So yep. It's, and the difference is people are saying, actually the system's listening to me. I'm actually getting across my thoughts. Yep. And so a lot of our clients are saying, actually, I'm finding stuff that I didn't even think to ask about. And so what we're trying to do is, is as I say, pick up those parts of the community that typically are, have been averaged out. Yep. Yep, like the 2.3 children that most families have. You know, where, where, is, where is that point three, three yeah, of the yeah. child? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, it sounds like you must have had a huge investment to build a system like that. Yeah. Well, what's, what sort of yeah. infrastructure do you use to, to support that? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting. I'd say one of the, the core parts of our success has been uh, our choice of technology. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, 
what we've managed to do is, is, is keep it away from being an ICT project. So the technology that we've used, we've been able to have the, the AI designed and trained by people who are experts in public consultation or active mm -hmm. listening. So instead of becoming an ICT project where we've got to translate what we want the AI to do, people are literally being able to type it in and having a look at conversations uh, and, and train them. Uh, so it's been, um, you know, it's a bit of trial and error, I suppose, over over a few years to get um, to get to be where we are. Um, but I think it's the I always say to um, our designers, uh, you know, if you don't, if you wouldn't say it in person, don't make the AI do it. So I had a I had a we've banned the word chatbots because chatbot. I don't know if you've had bad experience with the chatbots that everyone has had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so that's one of our big barriers, actually, is people go, oh, not another chatbot, because it does look a little bit like a chatbot. Yep. Um, but it's, it's very different. So it's a, we call them conversational agents, because yep. their sole purpose is to engage you and find out stuff, not to provide you with a, yep. you know, a bus timetable uh, or, those, or those sorts of things. So we're very clear to make sure it's entirely conversational. So it will never say, oh, Matt, um, choose from the following items. Because yeah. no one sees that. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it, it sounds quite radical. And as a product, I'm wondering how you sell that product to your clients. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, in some ways, it's the classic, you know, find out the pain points of your clients. Um, we're a little bit different. So we're, um, so I, I say to people, look, I'm the, I'm the founder of a startup, uh, but it's wholly owned by Becker. Yeah. So it was kind of created uh, within Becker. We used the classic kind of entrepreneurial uh, approach, which is, you know, tell no one what you're doing, um, work around the system, yeah. uh, you know, until you finally have something where people look up and go, wow, that's, you know, that's incredible. Um, so uh, we're now at the point where we have uh, one of the benefits, I think, of being entrepreneurial is that you can tap into the client networks that your firm already has. Mm -hmm. Um, so part of our, I guess, our, our benefit is, is knowing fairly intimately what the pain points of, you know, hundreds or thousands of our clients are, and so being able to both develop the product, but then go to our clients and say, hey, you know, is it, is it true that, um, you know, this is a real problem? Because if it is, you know, we yep. might have a solution. Yep. And I'm curious how you got from thinking AI is probably an interesting thing. Yeah to frankly, <laughs> you know, because you could have gone a lot of different ways with, with AI. Yeah. You know, how, how did you make that leap from AI looks like an important technology to be involved with in our business in some way to, and this is a viable product to, to take to our clients? I suppose the way I'd answer that is, is you have to have a story that people can latch onto. Um, so if we were doing a customer experience chatbot, people would be like, mm, good on you, yep. good on you. Yep. Uh, but we, we, we genuinely have a, a social mission, as I say, which is to, to change the way that consultation works so that, uh, it, it, so that the, I suppose the people who, who moan the loudest aren't the ones who dominate the solutions, because that's, that's terrible for this, well, it reinforces the status quo. Yep. Um, and so by having that very clear, um, is it mission or vision, or those sort of things, and, and what we found was that people would jump on board and say, actually, that's, that's what I want to contribute to. We've just hired two um, salespeople, um, which, which frankly for a professional services firm is, is a little bit radical. They're not business development people, they're salespeople. Yeah. Um, but people were saying, well, didn't you find it hard to find salespeople? And I'm like, well... Not really, because when I explained the mission of what we're doing, they were like, oh, that's great. Yeah, I'd love to be part of that. So effectively what we're doing is we've, we've, we've created a, um, a use case for AI that is guided by this vision of no voice left behind. You sound very values driven. More of a poet than a quiet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm somewhere between, I think, yes. <laughs> I'm just wondering if you've always been a poet, really, and, and the quant bit was something you, you stumbled into. Yes, I still wonder that myself, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, 
You've got Frankly. It's working well. Yeah. You've done a number of different things at Beckerin in other places. Yeah. What are you starting to think about to do in the future? Well, you picked AI as a winner yeah. three or four years ago. Yeah. Are you starting to pick a new winner as you look forward? Uh, that's interesting, actually. It, it, you know, I think we're on the beginning of the curve of AI. So one of the challenges we have is people will say, oh, Matt, can it do this? I'm like, yeah, it can do that. Oh, can it do this? Um, I'm of the firm view, you know, AI will change the world, has already changed the world. I think natural language processing will have the biggest impact of all of the AI because it will be able to communicate and I think that's very powerful in terms of being able to, you know, change, ch maybe change, um, you yeah, know, change the, uh, change the way the world works, you know, for, for good or for, for not. Mm -hmm. um, we're obviously focused on on the you know changing the world for good, but I think yeah, people are grossly underestimating the the impact that it will have. We um, one of the things I love about AI, um, I have been accused earlier on in my career of you know not not sticking with things. You know, why didn't you? you know, I thought you were doing that. Oh no, you're doing that. I mean, one of the things with AI is that there seems to be about a a you know six week cycle before some new technology will come along, which kind of blows your mind that you couldn't do six weeks ago. So a lot of the stuff we're doing now, um, so we're taking advantage of some of the big NLP models that have just come out from OpenAI and others. You know, we literally dreamed about doing three months ago. Um, and with GPT-4 and other things coming, you know, it's just accelerating like this. So my, um, I'm quite happy sitting in, in the field of NLP AI. I, I think if, if frankly doesn't work out, then there's a whole lot of stuff um, you know, that, that we can do. It still seems like an odd place to be doing it within an engineering consultancy firm and, and not a IT firm to me. Yeah, I'm, no, I'm, but I'm, I, and I'm probably yeah, wrong to think yeah, that. Yeah, I think that's, out, that's a little bit outdated now. So yeah. 20 years ago, that would have been right. Um, but, te you know, in the last 10 years, we have become a, we call ourselves an advisory um, technology and design firm. And, um, you know, the, the, I, can't, I couldn't give you the exact figure, but you know, the, in terms of FTEs, you know, engineers make up perhaps 65% of, of staff. So we are the largest advisory professional services firm in New Zealand. So you take away all the engineering design, we're still the largest yep. advisory professional services firm. So yeah, uh, I suppose I should have made that clear early on. Um, I think most of the firms like us have gone that way. Yeah. Because the, the skills, you know, the quant skills and te technology skills that we have, have have allowed us to grow that kind of yeah. technology advisory firm. Yeah. Um, and plus, I think, in any professional services firm, at least any design firm, you know, we have to be very careful because a lot of the stuff that we've made money out of for 100 years, designing bridges or buildings or ventilation systems, you know, will be done by AI. Yeah. Um, and so what we need to do is to keep growing as a firm uh, being able to do those things that are kind of, you know, won't, won't be replaced by an algorithm. Yep. So if we just step back a bit to, to that transition from being an engineering firm to being an advisor yeah. and more advisory based firm, where did, the, you say all the other firms are doing that as well, yeah. Was, yeah. was Becker a follower there or? It's just, it's just natural, when you sit down each year and you work out, hey, where's the growth market? Every firm comes up with the same thing, which is it, it's digital. Um, and we're seeing that even more so now as we're heading into digital twins. Yep. Um, IoT and AI is kind of, you know, this is sort of a, a, cir a reinforcing circle of all those sorts of things. Uh, and the firms that are really well placed to be able to, you know, mix that with infrastructure are the, the former engineering consulting firms yep. like us. So I don't think we were advanced or behind. We we're always worried that we we're behind, but um, I, I think it, you know when you look at all the firms, they've kind of all gone the same, all gone the same way. Yeah. Um, some more successfully than others, but uh, that's kind of the future, I suppose. Okay. Mm. And your future is still with AI. I think so. Not with Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, Bitcoin will do what it does, I suppose. Uh, I, I, I think I should comment on why, why, why I said that, because uh, I know Matt's been a long-term 
investor and evangelist for Bitcoin, amongst other things. Um, I don't know if he's planning to use it as his retirement message. <laughs> well, either he would be with zero or not. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's an interesting, yeah, for, for me, that, that whole crypto thing is, is that, again, it's that mixture of infrastructure, or at least financial infrastructure, yep. uh, technology and society. So that's why I find that so, you know, so fascinating. I'm, I'm not a big risk taker, so, you know, I'm, I'm probably, uh, you know, never going to make myself rich out you, of it. But You're not a big risk taker. But, but I love, I love watching the interplay. I'm, I'm, I'm smiling as you say that, because I'm thinking, so you started off an engineer, and decided to go into the Defence Force, then decided to go into chefing, and then went back to engineering, and then whilst he's engineering, he goes off at quite a tangent into AI. That sounds like risk-taking yeah. to me. Yeah, I was told, um, was it never bet on a race unless you're running in it? Yep. So I actually think, yeah, it's not, a, it's not, it's not that big a risk, really. Um, it's, I think it's that's what most risk-takers <laughs> say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I... I suppose, and I'll come back to this thing, you know, there are entrepreneurial people who would, you know, who would have taken Frankly out and started up by themselves and done all those sort of things. I find it comforting being part of a big corporate mm. that you have those, um, uh, you know, those, I suppose, those mechanisms, those processes. You know, people often say to me, oh, you know, I hope Frankly is successful so you'll make a fortune. And, you know, I have no equity in Frankly. Mm. If Frankly works out well, then the whole of Becca benefits, and if it yep. doesn't work out well, the whole of Be Becca will forget it, I suppose. So, yep. so yeah, in terms of risk, I, I think, well, I guess what I, yeah, it's that whole, um, I think entre entrepreneurs take higher risks, but entrepreneurs perhaps are more certain about, can be more certain about the outcomes, because we take things a little bit slower, and we have, you know, because we've got to work through processes, you can't just do what you like, you've kind of got to... Says the man who talked about going around the processes and not telling people what you were doing. Well, <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> We've got to the stage now, I guess, where it's been, it's been absorbed into the mothership. So, yes. so yep. now we have an advisory board and we meet with the advisory board every two weeks. Um, their goal really is to accelerate, accelerate what we're doing. And uh, I think yeah, a lot of people, we have a... We have an incubator. We've had an incubator for maybe four years now, um, and that's okay. that's designed to basically be a venture capital kind of operation within Becca um, to fund to fund things, particularly things that don't rely on uh, getting paid by the hour. Yeah, because that's the I guess that's the tyranny of being a professional services consultant. Yeah, um, and so we've had I couldn't tell the exact numbers, but it's a very high success rate. In terms of you know things that have come out of our come out of our incubator, uh, and that's because I guess we're you know we're slow and um, think carefully about these things. Yeah. Uh, but we've we've separated those from the you know from the KPIs and the and the um, you know, so the tyranny of productivity and those sort of things. I would have thought of having your own incubator, or your own internal venture funds is yeah. quite novel. Um, you wouldn't see it in many other... I think it is very novel, yeah. 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 People are often surprised. A lot of our clients go, wow, I wish we had that. Um, yeah. I and mean, part of it's because we're employee-owned and so our shareholders are all staff. Um, and so, you know, if we have the staff on board, um, you know, then we have that freedom to you know, reapply, I suppose, what would be a dividend payout into reinvestment. Yep. Um, and in fact, what we've seen is a lot of the equity holders in Becker are keen for higher risk. You know, they feel like we're a hundred, hundred year old company making most of our money out of designing bridges. And they want to, they want to see us get into the digital side, so, yep. um, yep. at least for the moment. And, and it's part of it's our success rate, I guess. We, we don't have that pushback from shareholders. Yep. I think that's always one of the challenges with employee shareholder companies. The employees kind of want to keep the managers to account to make sure they're performing, you know, yeah. them and the organisations yeah. performing, yeah. That they're not happy with the status quo. Yeah. I think employee shareholder companies are a wonderful thing, but they are double-edged. Not only do they keep the employees in the firm, but they drive the employee, the employees to push the managers to, to deliver. 
Um, kind of. I mean, the employees are the managers, I, I guess. The shareholders are the managers yep. of NECA. But there's more people underneath the right. shareholders than our managers, so it pushes upwards. Yeah. 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 Mm. Interesting. Interesting. Do we have any questions from the audience before we think about winding up? Oh, right, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And it was quite interesting because I haven't really engaged that much before and it went very negative very quickly. Like you said, there was a few very vocal people, but then the bulk of the community was actually probably on the same side as the vocal people who we weren't a fan of what was going on, or at least that's what it seemed. And so I guess, is that something that Franklin is supposed to yeah. step in? And I can tell you a bit of a story, actually, with Franklin. We, uh, one of the great things is we have, um, you have to train... AI, so um, and it's not magic. You, you have to run conversations through it and see what it thinks it's doing, convince it to do this and that and this. Uh, and we knew that um, there, one of the benefits of Frankly is it is it gives the ability for people who are really angry to be able to vent their anger and know that every word they say is being taken down, which is very doing stand up or a you know, a pop up or whatever they call them, because you know, you, well, you'd rather people wouldn't do that because it's a bit hard on the on the staff. Um, and so we, what we decided, and so my testers are basically Becca. You know, I send an email out saying, "Hey, have a go at Frankly." And what we did is we put up a dashboard um, uh, because AI is really good at detecting emotion and and scoring it. And so we said to people, "Hey, we'll put up this live dashboard." Uh, what we want you to do is to either be really angry and unpleasant, the most angry and unpleasant you can be, and see if you can get on the leaderboard, uh, or uh, be the most uh, distracting, you know, tease it, just be really sarcastic and, uh, you know, try and take it off, 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 um, off, its, off its course. And so what we did, of course, is we... <laughs> <laughs> I never knew, never knew Becca people could be so rude. But we, we had all these amazing conversations of really angry, obnoxious, arrogant people, which we were able to train frankly on. So now frankly is brilliant. If you're really angry, you have a great experience. You're like a 9 out of 10. Um, and so what we're trying to do is say, well, these people can now come off social media because they now have a direct line to uh, the organisation uh, and can be sure what they, say, um, what they say has been taken into account. Yeah, so I, um, I suppose what I'm seeing a lot with online surveys is that, is that people are, I suppose it's hard to get, it's, it's, it's hard to get the depth of insights. So I don't, I don't know that particular situation, but they probably said, look, there was 50% of the population that supported it, because that's normally how it works out, and 50% that didn't. Uh, but what frankly does is it actually works out, it, it won't leave you alone. <laughs> won't leave you alone until it feels it's got enough information about why you believe something. So you might say, oh, I just hate road cones. So oh, that's interesting. Why, why, what have you got against road cones? And you'll say, well, you know, la da da And And what it's doing is it's trying to pick up information and themes and things that it can, and it can use. And what we find with the online surveys is that people will say, look, I really don't like road cones. And then it's left up to the client to go, well, why do they think that? Um, so it's a very different, um, you get very different data from AI and so what we would say in a situation like that is use frankly, don't use an online uh, survey because all you'll do is get the average and frankly no, excuse my pun, uh, no, <laughs> the averages aren't kind to anyone, it doesn't, it doesn't really tell you much. Yeah. Because one of the big issues with that one there is whenever there was a negative So we did an interesting, interesting. Um, I was in a in a conference. This was years ago, explaining frankly, and um, 
Auckland Transport and Auckland Council for the last long-term plan did an amazing job. I think they spent a million and a half or something getting um, survey responses on, the, <laughs> I can't remember the number, is it $8 billion worth of spending. And it was brilliant. It was like record-breaking. It was about 1.2% of people responded. <laughs> and uh, it's normally less than that. So they did a really good job. And I, so I said to the people here, you know, did anyone respond to the survey? And it was, it was a relative representative. It was 1.5% 1, 1 of people. It was about 150 people. And I don't know what that is. About four yeah. people put their hands up. I thought, brilliant. And, and so um, how many of you actually have views on transport in Auckland? 100% everyone. And so that the issue is not that the people in the middle don't have views or don't care, and that's particularly what clients might say, is that you're not asking them about what they care about. And so that you might care about the pedestrian crossing for your kids at the local school. Now an online film is not going to ask you that. Whereas AI, that's interesting, tell me more. What, what, is, it about, what is it about the safety of your kids that's important? Um, all for, you know, if they stay on the call for 45 minutes, it doesn't cost us any more than... Well, cents on the dollar more. So what we're trying to do is get people talking and get those those insights. And I did talk about the fringes, but actually it's the middle as well. They they do have views. It's just that they're not particularly motivated to perhaps give them to you. So are you getting bigger response rates? You know, bigger response rates as well. Not not just longer ones, but yeah. So that's that's the evolution of AI. Is is that we have the um, bad experience People have had bad experiences with chatbots, really bad experiences. Um, I think Oscar from e New Zealand basically s destroyed the market for AI because of his you know, annoying inability to do most things. Now he's a little bit better now than he was. Uh, so what we find is that it's, it's the challenge is to get people onto the system because they, they have very low expectations of what it will be like. Mm -hmm. uh, but once they're on the system, uh, you know, we get amazing um, Amazing feedback. People are like, you know, and we deliberately try to make them aware that it's not a person. But people are like, you sure it's not a person? It was just talking to me like a person. I'm like, no, 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 it's absolutely, absolutely not a person. So, so it tends to go a bit viral. Yeah. Uh, and so, one of the things we're working on now is how do you how do you get people onto the system? Um, uh, you know, if if they have to do three clicks to get there, they're probably not going to do it. Um, mm. If it's not personalised, they're probably not going to do it. Um, so that's, I think that's the that's the challenge. But that challenge will go away once, you know, as I say, once people are more familiar with the state of the technology now. Uh, yeah. So our hope would be the thing with AI is that all of the investments up front. So we've spent, you know, a million dollars plus getting the system going. Uh, but to rock it out for an application is, is not, you know, you don't spend a million dollars every time. Um, and so what we say to our clients is, well, you know, you've been used to, um, you know, one of the things that frustrates me about consultation is that you'll, you know, you're a day late and they say consultation is over. And I'm like, what do you mean? You don't want to hear from me anymore about transport? Is yep. the, and, and so with the thing with AI is you just leave it on forever. So it's 24-7. Uh, it doesn't cost us anything to leave it on, really. Uh, and so what that means is that you can get a longitudinal view. So are people's views changing over time? Uh, because frankly, they, sh excuse the pun, they, <laughs> they should be changing over time if you're doing your job. Yeah. Uh, you know, if people are understanding better what your outcomes are, um, then you should be you know, getting different, different responses. Um, one of the, I guess one of the opportunities for AI uh, is the, um, and this is the whole for good or for bad, but the personalization of it. So the more you know about what people like and don't like, the more you can encourage them to come back onto the system. So you can say, hey, Peter, I know you hate road cones. I've got a few more questions about road cones. Would you like to answer them? And I know that it's an 80% chance that you'll say yes. That's, yep. the, that's the st statistic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it cost me nothing to get your views again. And so I can actually, Auckland is, uh, you know, at least Peter, if he's representative, you know, are, are getting more or probably literally hating road cones more. Yep. Uh, yep. Mm. Mm. I'm, I'm just wondering whether or not frankly was used for any of the consultations about the rail link because that's there's got ongoing oh, the light rail. Yeah. Uh, no, no, the um, rail central rail central rail. Yeah. yeah. With the, the, the problems we had in the city. But that's another story for another day. Yeah. Um, yeah. <coughs> I think that 
What I'd say is that we, we, we're so used to, uh, oh, what do you call it, you know, democracy, the mm -hmm. fact that the majority should win. And that's because we come from a, you know, quant technology. Um, I think what we, what we need to assume is that actually you know, we can do things so that almost everyone wins. And you do that by listening to the whole range of voices, not just compressing them into a, into a number. Mm. You know, the, the, the fact that this particular retailer has these particular issues, you, know, you can collect that in frankly. And you can codify it. You can say, well, these are all the, these are all the issue, people that have issues with this particular thing. And then you can work, work down uh, through those. Um, and because it's AI, you know, if you have a million responses, it's not that much more difficult than having a hundred. Yep. The AI does the work for you, and, and instantly. You don't have to wait 10 weeks for someone to, to read it all. Uh, it's all done. Mm. Mm. Matt, thank you very much oh, sure. for that very engaging discussion about AI. You're clearly passionate about finding out what people think about these, these mm. projects. Mm. Um, you clearly have a strong view about equity rather than equality. Mm. Um, and it's refreshing to hear that. Mm. Um, so thank you very much for your time today. Oh, it's a privilege. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity.